Hello, everybody. Turn up in my headphones, Charles. Turning it up, 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 up. <laughs> hello, 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 everybody. One and all, welcome back to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any old fantasy today. Today's a very special oh. day because we are continuing our discussion of A Little Hatred, book one of the Age of Madness trilogy, which is part of the greater world of the First Law, written by mm-hmm. Joe Abercrombie, Lord Grimdark mm-hmm. himself. Yes. Yes, we are, and I'm just pumped to get into this, Charles. We had our part one episode come out just a couple days ago, I guess it'll be, Mm -hmm. and I'm, yeah, I think no further ado, I'll give my spoiler warning, which is that we'll be discussing Age of Madness, and since that takes place in the age, or geez, uh, we're discussing a little hatred, and since that takes place in the Age of Madness trilogy, we won't be holding back with spoilers from uh, anything that came before a little hatred. So that's the original First Law trilogy. It's the three standalones. We won't hold back from Sharp Ends either. Uh, and yeah, we're just excited to get into this book. So if you haven't read those previous books and you don't want anything spoiled, then now's a good time to turn this down in your headphones before we get too deep into it. Well said, sir. And for anyone listening to this out of order, this is part two. Last time we talked a lot about Orso. We talked a lot about Savine. We talked a lot about, uh, I think it was Gunner and Leo. So we're going to pick up with the rest of these POV characters today, and we're going to get more into just some other interesting plot points, themes, things like that. So if you really want to hear us deep dive into some of those main characters I just listed, check out part one. But otherwise, welcome to part two. Now, Dylan, oh, so much happened. I, you, the other day when we recorded part one, we ended with a tease about Clover and his ending to his arc in this book, which was one of the more shocking moments for me in the whole series so should we just just jump right into clover at this point and see what we can uncover about sir jonas clover yeah i say let's get into it i i really appreciate clover's character i thought you might too charles you always (laughs) enjoy he's got some corporal tunny type elements yeah. to him like that we Some. might remember from the heroes in the sense of at least as he starts off he's this ostensibly easygoing guy who all he wants to do is just lay in the shade and he wants to teach sword Swordsmanship to people who aren't particularly good at it and <laughs> just crack jokes, take it easy, and live that kind of life. And it's slowly unfurled that there's more to Jonas Clover than meets the eyes. We'll get into that moment at the end. Uh, That's well said. Tunney's an interesting comparison because he is kind of chasing after the easy life. (laughs) He he sets his ambitions low. He's but unlike Tunney, Clover is someone who's climbed the heights a little bit. You learn more about him as he goes. You learn that he like held the shield for the the feared and the the battle against the bloody nine on behalf of Bethod. You've learned he's an accomplished duelist and warrior. You learn all these things about him and that you see him, you're introduced to him. He's like you said, a barely interested teacher at the time. And he's kind of recruited by Black Calder to be a moral compass, a guiding light for his son Stour. 
And right. it's an interesting premise, something that we – it's interesting for Calder to be like, my son's a complete ass. Someone needs to come in and like, give him a reality check and you may be the guy patient enough to do it. Since you've kind of made this huge come around from being like arrogant warrior to – chill guy pursuing the e- easy life office space style for for a Northman. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Charles. Yeah, we know he has that past as Jonas Steepfield and mm. he was fighting in the circle and then he uh, I don't want do you know if the way he got his name Clover is revealed in this book or in The Trouble with Peace? Maybe That's I won't mention it. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. We won't mention it just in case. Gotcha. Uh, but but he, <laughs> he, learned, he learned humility by losing in the circle, I think is mm-hmm. fair to say at this point. And he has gone to this point where he's... Yeah, he's chasing that easy life, like you say, Charles, but there are people who still are walking around remembering who Clover used to be and what he's capable of. There's a great quote during his interaction with Carl Shivers (laughs) that Shivers says, uh, not that I don't like the act. It's a good one. Don't doubt you've got a lot of eager fools taking you for quite the figure of fun, but we both know what you are. <laughs> and Shivers knows a killer when he sees one, Charles. Yes, he does. And Shivers has probably also had his good big old helping of humble pie and come up in and all mm. that as well. So I think he can kind of see some of that in Clover as well. And they're an interesting two to compare also because there's almost some kind of denial about Clover that Shivers doesn't quite have. And Clover's more on the pursuit of not doing anything and more affable. And then he'll just surprise you with his acts of violence when Shivers is like, I'm dangerous and I never said otherwise it's it's kind of an interesting the, the subtle differences between them well said charles yeah it's this point of shivers back in the heroes had this i'm going to accept who i am by just doubling down on that mm-hmm. i'm a ruthless killer and he mm-hmm. had a while where that was pretty much the, the his whole identity mm-hmm. and then Jonas Clover went the other route of being like, I might have that underlying a lot of this, but I feel like I can stay out of things and I can live a better life. And he has pursued that. But it's a theme that we see oftentimes with Abercrombie's work where you can you can take the man out of the violence, but you can't necessarily take the violence out Mm. of the man. And oftentimes people come knocking, looking for (laughs) the person that you used to be. And that's what happens with Clover when, because I mean, Calder might not have been looking for that person, but Stour was seeing that person deep inside Clover. Right, and same with Shivers as well. And it's funny to see Clover and Stour together because Clover, just in his mind, acknowledges that everything Stour is doing is wrong and ridiculous. But he's like, I'm not going to say anything, get myself killed. So he's like, very wise, sir, very good choice. (laughs) And like does all Mm -hmm. these things that he knows are the wrong thing to do or the arrogant thing to do or doesn't bother to teach Stour because he knows how like constantly on the edge of violence Stour is. So he's almost just patiently willing to do whatever it is to get by as Stour's uh, assistant. And it's it, it makes you want like, one of the things, one of the themes that I picked up about this book was almost just like the changing of the guard, kind of like how experience is not always successfully handed down to the youth. This mm. idea of like, yeah. these people have all learned these lessons already, but there's no telling them they have to make their own mistakes. Yeah. I feel like is a large part of how this book works. And I think that's in, in Stower's case and Clover's case is like Clover's like, I know all these mistakes, but like, 
it's not, I'm not going to convince you by telling you. I just have to kind of go along with it for now. And, and there's something about that dynamic that comes across in multiple characters in this in this book. Yeah, you definitely see that. You see that with Calder trying to pass down lessons to Stour. You see that with Finry trying to pass down lessons to Leo. Mm -hmm. In yeah, (laughs) in its own way, you saw some of that with Giselle trying to pass down lessons to Orso. And of course, you see it with... Giselle passed down these like, hey, the best you can do is just kind of be a figurehead type lesson. <laughs> and it's funny that Orso, Orso kind of like away f- placated Giselle <laughs> in yeah. some ways. But then there's also and Therese. Glockta and, oh yeah, Therese, yeah, uh, Therese as well. And also Glockta trying to pass down lessons to Savine mm-hmm. and... The extent Dog to which man, any Tarika. of the right, right, Dogman Tarika, right, and that, we'll we'll get into that more because that's yes, it's a very will. interesting dynamic with Dogman trying to Eastern and Dogman are kind of opposing forces in the lessons they're trying to give to Rika. We'll get into that, but hmm. yeah, sticking sticking with Clover, there's a lot of lessons that he wants to teach about just reasonableness and wisdom, but he's also got this intense ruthlessness to him that we see in two main moments come up. The, the first of which is when he has that moment with Magweer. Yes. Is his name. Yeah. Who's, he's just one of Stowers annoying posse that, is constantly sneering and making fun of Clover and Clover just plays the fool until finally we get them in this battle. And Clover wants no part of the thick of a battle because that's where people get killed. So what he chooses to do, which is uh, twisted, but it's classic Abercrombie, like twisted, but also humorous. How, because it's Magweer guy, there's not a lot of... uh, uh, he's not a likable guy. He's really annoying. So it feels like he gets what he deserves when Clover actually st- stabs him through the neck. Yes. I, I believe with an arrow. And he uh, he ends up carrying the body that he just created right. all the way back to get healed. <laughs> And then by the time he's back, the guy's long dead and Clover pretends that (laughs) he is like, oh, no, cut down in the prime of youth. It's almost a Casca like moment, (laughs) like one of those Casca moments from Best Serve Cold where he um, would kill uh, some of his um, gracious hand generals or whatever and then was like he was such a good man gone before right. his youth <laughs> if only it was my fault my fault <laughs> it's my fault yeah that's what Casca would do <laughs> yeah and clover's like oh no it's so terrible he was such a young promising soul yeah. and he's like well i guess by this point i couldn't make it all the way back to the front line so i guess i'll just wait here so he <laughs> finds his way out and it's a really it, it's it feels like an unexpected moment. It's not as much of a shocker as the one that we get toward well, the end. Part Clover. of Clover's thing is obviously like being realistic, but then yeah. just how fast he makes these decisions too, mm-hmm. like, and how little hesitation there is. Yeah. And it one of the things that Abercrombie always loves to explore is like, like just because you do horrible things doesn't mean you're evil. Essentially, like. Good people can do bad things too. And in this case, it's like punched up even more because what Clover does is so shocking and so like calculated and malicious at times. Like literally just full on intent to murder a dude under the guise of combat and then use like bringing his corpse back to the wounded as an excuse to not have to go back and fight. It's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And it's... It's something that has been going on in his perspective, this idea of not hesitating when you get your moment, but it's hard to know it would come to fruition in such a savage way because I think even the reading experience is one where you feel like Clover is this kind of silly, 
jester type who just wants to take it easy and he has that element to him and you also see him spare Rika in that moment Mm -hmm. where he happens upon her when Stour is hunting her down when when he doesn't stand to benefit at all he doesn't he doesn't have this evil part of him that wants to kill for killing's sake but when it comes down to him or someone else he will choose him every time he's learned that self-preservation. And there's no moment that's more apparent uh, when it comes to that than is the moment with Wonderful during that whole scene oh with my uh, gosh. Stour. Yeah, and because Scale, yeah. that ending, there was the whole duel with Stour and Leo, which, you know, Clover was against the whole time, but he was just kind of making jokes about it constantly. And the whole time with Wonderful, they were joking back and forth yeah. about the inexperience of youth and how they're making all these mistakes and how like, isn't it funny that these are the people that are governing our whole nation? You know, they're, they have some camaraderie there. So in the end, when Stour just decides he's going to kill scale and take his place as King of the Northmen early, he's pushes Clover for a test of loyalty and without any hesitation, Clover goes from joking with Wonderful to stabbing her in the heart. She doesn't even react. She just is like, oh, and and dies. It's it was it, it was intense and it's wonderful too. Wonderful. Yeah, and we remember Wonderful and she's a great character in the heroes and mm-hmm. then we get to know her even better in the sharp there's a sharp end short story that has her in it and then again here we get even more wonderful and she's likable, she's got a quick wit, she's a character that you like having around and then in a moment uh, Clover t- just when faced with the option of his own basically i think he sees when stour says like kill her that his choices are both of them die or only wonderful dies and the the, (laughs) logan nine fingers would say that's no choice at all and he ends up just killing her and it's this this moment yeah she just says cloak and then he stabs her in a hug and it says you have to pick your moment he'd always said so told everyone who'd listen have to recognize it when it comes and seize it with no care for the past and no worries about the future that's what he Mm. says as he's hugging wonderful as he kills her so those instincts kick in and he does what he has to it's just uh, yeah it's tough from a character that you've learned to really, at least if you have my reading experience with this, like learn to really love over the course of the book. And we didn't, yeah. the, the, the moment earlier, uh, we get the sense Clover's capable of it. This is why it's fantastic foreshadowing, I think, by Joe Abercrombie, is that moment with Magweer completely foreshadows that Clover's capable of something like this, mm. but we hate Magweer. He's just annoying and he's constantly sneering and all this stuff. Right, right. And we're like, okay, well, that was a weird moment that Clover's capable be realistic, of that, but uh-huh. also you have to be realistic <laughs> about these things. Yeah, sure. And also, who cares about that guy? Screw him. But then when it happens to Wonderful, you're like, whoa, that's what this guy <laughs> is capable of. Yeah. yeah. And Wonderful is always so like enterprising and like, you know, rising the ranks and you always liked yeah. her. So, Man, what a great use of a of a character and a character death. You know, Hypercrumpy knows how to play his cards, <laughs> for sure. Right. This is, this he is knows like... the pieces on the chessboard and when they have to be <laughs> removed. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Not everyone can make it to the end. And in this age of madness, you got people like Clover who will just, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Things can change on a whim, change on a dime, and you got to be able to... Roll with the tide, right side with the winners, as he says, and yeah, whatever it costs. So that's uh, that's Clover for you. Anything else about Clover before we move on to our next character? Just briefly, it's interesting seeing him contrasted with someone like Kernan Craw, 
from mm. the heroes where so clover has this bit at the beginning where it's like everyone says you're a straight edge clover <laughs> and we've seen it before with kernan where it's like me a straight edge but it's like kernan Croft totally is a straight edge like <laughs> he he made a lot of really always trying to make the noble decision and getting caught in all that and we've seen it before then when clover is like me a straight edge like what do you mean i've like i was loyal to this person until they got killed by this person that was loyal to that person he does that bit and we're like okay but we're primed to or to be ready for clover to show himself to be a real straight edge but he doesn't really <laughs> in the end so it's good to see abercrombie take a different approach and uh, yeah that's it that's it from me. Yeah, Clover. that is an interesting perspective. A lot of these characters walk that fine line. Like we talked about Gunner Broad the other day, and it's like yeah. such an interesting mix of character traits in Gunner and in Clover, where they just like yeah. they bore this line of atrocity and likability. <laughs> like in an interesting mix uh, like i rarely see characters in fiction you know some characters are just evil and do bad things and some characters are noble and do good things it's like and there's always been a mix but i think as abercrombie's been writing more and more books he's started to be able to write these characters that are even more mixed up in complicated ways it's yeah. like yeah clover is a patient teacher and he can joke with people and then kill his friends and be patient with horrible people and and like act fast and then gunner's the same way he's got he's a family man but he loves violence but he's you know he's got these drug like alcohol addiction and all these other things and you're like wow what is going on with these characters and i i just think to that 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 speaks to abercrombie being like eight books deep (laughs) in this world and dwelling on these parts of human nature and it's awesome to see these characters almost like as the result of him honing his craft i think well said charles i would totally agree so speaking of great characters who should we talk about next it's probably time to get into talking about ricka let's talk about ricka we don't want to put her off any longer this the story opens with ricka ricka and iserni fail these were like when I first opened this book, I'm like, "This is Iserni Fail, like from uh, <laughs> from the uh, first Law trilogy with Krumicky Fail, and then you have the Dogman's daughter. What an interesting combination that we're in right now. You know, it's it's it was quite a way to start this book. The two of them on the road. <laughs> exactly, Charles. It gives you a real taste right away of what you're getting into here. We're not going to be repeating point of views from the first law trilogy but we're not going to be getting too far away either we're going to be dealing with the next generation Mm -hmm. and is there any fail is i mean she's literally named in the first law trilogy Uh, she's the Mm -hmm. she had a decent little part in it yeah yeah she's she had like dialogue and all that yes exactly (laughs) So it's easy to not remember that, that that's her because she's um, she does feel like something of a throwaway character in that book or I don't know if throwaway is right, but like a, a one note. Yeah, and a side character. It's Yeah, a side character. But she's back with a vengeance here and she's learned a lot of lessons and she's trying to pass them down to Rika, who's right away struggling with the long eye and it's it's interesting to see and to see the kind of person that might be the dog man's child right and in a world where we've been told constantly magic is leaving this earth to have someone who Mm. is gifted with these magical abilities this long eye to see the future that also is someone from the north and a woman as well it's just a really interesting perspective on a book that seems to be going in a totally other direction into industry yeah exactly charles and it's great to have more female characters in point Mm -hmm. of view roles in this book because we know Mm -hmm. uh, pharaoh was the only one in the first law trilogy and he's yeah. yeah yeah so i mean there's great female characters throughout abercrombie's work but it's good to see him expanding that and ricka is a great way to start this one she 
she starts out in something of this almost silly feeling persona and we get to see as she gets like she's lived a relatively easy life leading into this as the dogman's daughter and Ufrith and just trying to figure out who she is and then she's suddenly thrust into a war when she's grown up in a world it's hard to imagine knowing what we knew from the first law trilogy but a world where there hasn't really been a lot of war in the north for a long time right and yeah the book kicks off with her home, the dog man's home, someone we know and we really like, yeah. his home is burning. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. my gosh, that's how this book starts. And it's interesting to use the dog man too, because we know, like, look, if you're burning dog man's home, you gotta be bad news. <laughs> because he's the <laughs> nicest guy there is. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And it's great to see how the dog man is so widely respected mm-hmm. at this point. It's. It, we did that character profile way back on the dog man and mm-hmm. we know he holds a very special place in our heart uh, our sure. hearts charles mm-hmm. and uh, speaking of hearts uh, that's Ooh. a big point of contention between the lessons that Isser and fail and the dog man are trying to pass mm. down to Ricka. so Isser and fail has that message of you have to make of your heart a stone mm. and the dog man's way of interacting with his daughter is like i've seen a lot of people do that and it's like he's <laughs> he saw logan who has a heart underneath all of that mm-hmm. uh, become the bloody nine and he's like, I've seen a lot of people do that, and it's never turned out good for them. Yeah, they might rise through the ranks of whatever, but it's not a good way to be a person. And the dog man himself never made his heart a stone. So Rick is being pulled in two directions by her two mentor figures. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to see it you can start to see how that is influencing Rika towards the end of this book because this book kind of comes to a head at the end where Rika and leo and then savine and orso they do a little swap <laughs> partner swap and they all right. have kind of like this falling out and you can see that for Rika, having those two influences in her is in part driving a wedge between her and Leo. And she's spending all yeah. this time with Isser and Fail, and they're like running, being chased by dogs, having to hear Stower say all these horrible things about what he's going to do to her if he ever catches her. And it's really graphic and descriptive and horrible. Yeah. And so she's at that point filled with hate for this man and then also having eastern whisper into her ear the whole time and you know they're eastern from the hill we know she had to grow up in the school of hard knocks she was carrying an axe that she could barely hold as a kid defending the high places from bethod for like seven days straight so yeah there's a little contention there and and that's gonna rub off on you as a person and that was one of the things you had told me dylan going into this book because i knew that this book was gonna have some like generational character work in it and one of the things you had said was it's super fascinating to watch like how characters are the result of who their parents were almost and how that's a part of their characterization and the jury's still out for ricka yeah of of like is she going like raised by the dog man being influenced by eastern it's it's a bit more complicated with her than some of the other characters where you can see how someone like orso being raised by Jazal would just grow up not wanting to do anything and having affluenza. You're like, <laughs> right. okay, that makes sense. And someone like Savine, where it's like, I don't really care about money, but how else am I going to keep score? <laughs> so it's right. like this manipulative winning constantly. And then you get to Rika. She's a little bit, you know, doesn't fit the mold as well as some of these other characters. Yeah. I mean, I think she starts out fitting it well, where she's very carefree when she mm. is mostly probably being raised by we get the sense that Isser and fail uh, is becoming a much greater influence in Rick's life 
as the this book proceeds and the dog man is fading away both mm. like we can just his, the descriptions of him in this book are that he looks so frail and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff he's fading away both from Rika's life and just he's getting older mm-hmm. and he's uh, in, in the same way you almost see in Rika that part uh starting to fade more as she's being met with the brutality of war and she but she starts very carefree and silly and even when she's getting involved with leo at first she's basically she has this conversation with isser and where isser's like you can't just spend all day having sex that's not a way you can live life <laughs> and rika is like well it's worth trying <laughs> and so she's like, like gone into this completely hedonistic uh, like ah well you might as well just enjoy your life mm-hmm. and i feel like that is a very dogman laid back type attitude mm-hmm. and slowly but surely we see her moving more toward that brutality that though that Isern and the world seems to be demanding of her especially as she comes into her own power with the long eye right and you know this is the age of madness trilogy you know these are hard times and to see how these characters Mm -hmm. who would otherwise maybe just live happily in peacetime have to deal with the madness that's going on not just like at every level of the world everyone's at war right now and nothing's for certain and there's uprisings and things are changing faster than people can process and for someone like Rika who has to deal with this long eye component and being the, you know the heiress of the dog man and then now having to take eastern as a pupil because she's the only one that understands the long eye in any respect it it brings a lot of complications into it and they also there was also this interesting thing where Rika and Leo kind of like as kids yeah. were raised like with each other too which was an interesting mm-hmm. element so she got some of that union influence and Leo got some of that northern influence and you can kind of see that in their characters as well but you see how that falls apart which is what's interesting about that right yeah push comes to shove those two just i don't know maybe it's interesting Uh, Mm. they they seem good for maybe they were better for each other before ricka started it started getting more of this brutal streak and this idea of vengeance in her head because she was, she was patient and able to put up with him uh, Mm. and didn't demand uh, him to be things other than what he was. Uh, But then it it fell apart as, as things often do when there's a giant war pulling you in different directions. So it's, it's a tough one. I kind of like them together and yeah i did too uh, yeah Uh, but yeah she also has that fling with orso as you mentioned Mm -hmm. and i kind of like them together as well it's like (laughs) 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 i i think rick is just a fun person to be around when she's happy and in a good mood (laughs) because like you said she's the most carefree she's the most you know down to just laugh and joke around and have fun. So in, in those situations, it can be charming, but you, you see as she, she walks further and further away from that. And it's like you said, she's, she's always talking about making your heart a stone and she's learning that lesson throughout this book. And then you have the dog man saying, he's like, Oh, I like your heart the way it is. You know, it's, it's, oh. it's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's that the theme man. of like, the transition of power through generations and having to learn these lessons yourself and right. like just passing down wisdom isn't enough. Sometimes these lessons have to be learned the hard way in order to be truly learned. And we'll see what that means for Rika later on. But yeah. like it, at, at this stage of this book, at the end of this book, you know, she watches the duel between Leo and Stour and uses her long plays eye. Plays a critical role in it. She yeah. does play a critical role in it. She yells for him to duck at the right moment, which helps Leo win. And it's 
her blind desire for vengeance on Stour that drives the wedge between her and and Leo ultimately yeah. even after you know he she saved his life and they were you know starting to develop a real relationship she just chose she just couldn't get over her hatred for Stour yeah and yeah we'll have to see where things go in the trouble with peace with yeah, oh a, wait 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 we, she, she does and mm. she, the shiver stuff is is interesting yes as well. the shiver stuff the is interesting but i don't know how much see like i've read so far ahead now from the first book i'm trying to remember how much shiver stuff is in book one <laughs> that's what i don't know let's yeah well what we can talk about is that moment where she it's a great reveal i guess is the right way to speak about it when she's being chased and we know that it's stour and therefore black calders people who are chasing after her and then this guy with one metal eye and is uh, just towering stature shows up and we're like oh no (laughs) it's shivers and last we heard from shivers he he obviously was serving Calder by the end of uh, the heroes. And then in red country, he ran into Logan and Mm -hmm. he was like, ah, I, I guess I'll just tell Calder that you're dead. So we, last we heard he was still working for Calder. So we're thinking she's in trouble. It's freaking shivers. Yeah. (laughs) And then it's a great reveal that, it's like, no, Shivers came around to the dog man's side and <laughs> uh, that those two actually have a really good relationship and almost no one has a good relationship with Shivers, yeah. but Ricka does. And Ricka, they they do have a moment where Shivers is, uh, I'm confident this is in this book, where Shivers is, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I've been wrong before, though, but <laughs> it, I... It's not a big it's reveal. It's not like a real way. spoiler. A, oh, yeah. yeah. No. I'm pretty confident in this one. It's just Shivers being like, uh, why aren't you scared of me? And Rick is like, that eh, just never seemed all that scary. <laughs> like, <laughs> she has this ability to see through to the person that Shivers always wanted to be. And mm. it's just a touching relationship, those two. I agree. I it's like Shivers is like, it's Uncle Shivers. <laughs> yeah. But Rick goes like raised with Shivers. So it's the funny dynamic to see Shivers be a part of. And Ricka doesn't know any other way. So she sees right. him as a family member. And he's like, to, to, to have the idea of him filling that role, knowing who he is and what he's done, it's kind of funny. But it's almost kind of redemptive for him. You, 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 you're, yeah. I'm happy for Shivers in these moments like that he's able to have a meaningful relationship with Rick. I'm a, I thought that was great. And that he went to the dog man side. It's really nice for, he's a character that's dealing with that common theme. We've been talking about with people like Clover, Garn Broad, of course, Logan, it's this man of violence that just can't seem to get away from it. But he's gotten to the point where if he's gonna be a violent person, he might as well be on the side of someone that he knows has really good intentions and does his best. And mm-hmm. I think we feel more confident in the dog man as someone like that than we do in Calder. Yeah. And we also, yeah, uh, let alone Stower. So it's, yeah, it's nice to see what feels like character growth for Shivers and that he's still kicking around in a world where, I mean, a lot of these characters from the original trilogy are, are fading away in terms of, or haven't been seen at all. <laughs> like, like Logan. Like, yeah. I mean, MIA. Off from him. He's, yeah. <laughs> riding off in the sunset. So uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. They still kicking around shivers. Agreed. Agreed. Very cool. And I'm glad they brought him back and he's gotten a lot of cameos. No pun intended this point. by yeah. cool. <laughs> none at all uh well i don't know there's some other stuff with 
Shiver, uh, with Shivers, with Rika, where she gets, you know, the dogman sends her to Adjua and she meets all the people in court. She meets Savine. They exchange yeah. runes and jewelry and um, she ends up, they end up switching partners as well. <laughs> so she she has a fling with Orso. It, it's, it's fun, it's fun, but um, it kind of wraps up her plot and then or so goes on that big parade and and she has that vision of a chieftain dying and then we see Jazal has passed away so and she's making plans to go back to the north to to be reunite with the dog man so uh, yeah fascinating character looking forward to seeing where her lessons take her it's like all these characters kind of do a 180. <laughs> like it's, I guess this little hatred between all these characters that caused this huge, this huge like disruption between them. And this, now they're all kind of mixed up and it's all gotten complicated. And we'll, we'll yeah. see how that plays an effect in book two, I think. Well said Charles, but we can't move on until we talk about the last POV character that we have yet to discuss. And that is none other than Vic Dan Tarful. Vic Teufel. Teufel. Thank you. Vic Dan Teufel. And she's a very fascinating character. She starts as one of these rebels, these bridge burners, and she's quickly revealed to be a inquisitor. That was a double agent, and that was a fun. <laughs> that was a fun little reveal where it, it shows her getting dragged into the house of questions, and we're like, "Oh, we know what this is like in the house of questions. This is not going to yeah. end well." And then they're just like, "Well done, <laughs> Inquisitor Toyful," and everyone's like, "What? What?" So, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a great reveal, and it's you know, Vic is a character. This is. A, a reread for me. Vic is a character that I was slowest to really come to uh, appreciate, mm-hmm. to be honest, mm-hmm. uh, because she, the double agent thing definitely has her not getting off on the best foot for things like likability. And she's also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, which isn't everything, right? Some of our favorite characters aren't the most likable as people. Mm-hmm. But that being said, she's relatively flat affect it feels like and she's she's someone who it's like who even is the real Vic because she's just it's like mask after mask after mask and I think what I started to appreciate more is her own internal struggle with these ideas of who she is when she's such a, a liar and a traitor and a spy and uh, what does she even care about? What does she even uh, tether herself to in terms of her values? So mm. Vic is an interesting character, but I don't know about you, Charles. She took me some time to warm up to compared to some of the other ones. Yeah, I would say what eventually won me over for her is that she's slowly started to, again, there's always the character who real who has more of an idea of the kind of book that they're in and i mm. get that vibe for vic in this one it was yeah. glockta in the last one and i think it's vic for this one where she knows what kind of book that she she's in and she's mm. just like you side with the winners you do your job and but like life's too crappy to have the luxury wasn't she the one that said like like hating people is a luxury or something like that was that her or am i making that up but um i'm not sure and i might be making that up but this idea that she's just like she's almost got this why do i do this mentality you see she takes on tallow as her assistant slash like i don't know protege or something padawan (laughs) um Mm. while taking his sister hostage as a way to keep yeah. him motivated. So again, not really scoring in the like ability points there either, but she is scoring like ability points with Glockta. That was fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. Those two have a very interesting relationship and it's hard not to see those shades of Glockta in 
Vic the way that you're talking about. I mean, uh, she is an inquisitor and that's where we started with Sandan Glockta. It's, uh, I mean, she's, she feels very different, but she's also had a uh, humbling from really, I guess, affluent beginnings. Like mm-hmm. she, she was uh, a Dan. I mean, <laughs> she was yeah, a she's got noble. a Dan in her name. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think when I was first reading this, for some reason, I was wondering if we knew her father or if her father was some way, uh, someone that, Sept Dan Teufel, the, the master of mints. Oh, so we do. Yeah. Okay. I forgot about that. Yeah, okay. Who so we Glockta do actually him. convicted on trumped up charges in the blade itself, according to gotcha. the first law wiki. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's interesting that that hasn't been explored in their relationship, really. It's kind of, I guess, or even, maybe I'm wrong, but they don't like say it's an elephant in the room or anything. I mean, the and problem is I've read so far about... ahead now. I don't need to flex on everybody, but I am halfway through Wisdom of Crowds, uh, thanks to mm. Orbit Books for providing us with uh, early review copies. But um, there are, there has been moments where, again, it's this why do I do this conversation, and Glockta does bring it up. I'm, I'm, I think okay. in this book, but maybe it's the next book. But Again, huh. it's not a spoiler or anything, but they do acknowledge gotcha. like like i did the same thing like i like we we've been through oh, similar yeah, yeah, paths yeah. and it's like why do you work for me after i've done that to you and gotcha like there's there's reasons why you know they they do have these these conversations in this book okay yeah it's possible i just am misremembering so but i think anyway, the whole point way, was there's way. not really a remarkable reason why it's like that's the whole point about it Vic is like you side with the winners and it's like I was it's like I tried like being there for my family and stuff and I just had to watch them all suffer and die and stuff so she doesn't really have many loyalties yeah yeah it's true and it's it's interesting you get those moments with Vic she's very perceptive when it comes to people, so you get those moments like her perception of Savine is very interesting to see. She gets this moment where she gets to like basically come up with Orso's entire strategy of negotiation. Mm-hmm. And she she's clearly very, very competent. And yeah, she's that was a good scene where she slides and, yeah. the paper across, like, here's our right. offer. And then he opens it and it's like, don't say anything, but here's the situation. Here's what you can do. And then Orso exactly. plays it cool. This is one of those few moments where, like, the glimpses of Orso's potential kind of hmm. shine out in this book. Like, for the most part, he's suffering from affluenza, but he, his relationship and his admiration for... Uh, Vic in these moments was a standout for sure. Yeah, I I agree, Charles. And yeah, I, it's it's something that I I do enjoy the way that she is questioning herself with the hostage situation when it comes to Tallow and struggling with the fact with Tallow's sister I guess and struggling with the fact that she's coerced Tallow into doing this and also the idea of the sister being provided with what she perceives as a really good situation while having been unbeknownst to her held as a hostage all the time it's interesting seeing Vic struggle with the morality of all these things while still the behaviors that she puts out into the world are those of this cold unfeeling person as much as possible Mm -hmm. it's uh yeah uh, it's interesting to see the internal vulnerability uh, contrasted with the external cold yeah it's almost kind of like the opposite of clover (laughs) where it's like Mm. she's putting on this exterior of ruthless but then inside she's a bit of a softy, I guess. Not really, but she's like a bit more compassionate, I guess is a better word for it. But like yeah. 
she at least acknowledges there's a part of herself that recognizes that this is not a great thing to be doing but she's like what do you want from me it's like this is how it's this is how it has to be um so yeah it's interesting and i'm looking like i think she also gave us a good insight into the burners and to just the pulse of the people like she definitely has one of the better understandings of what's going on amongst the working class day to day. And that's such a huge part of this. uh, A huge part of this story is the idea of this uprising that happens in the chapter, the little people where there is this humongous uprising in Valbrek and that changes kind of the whole trajectory of this story and certainly changes Savine's life so and Vic was kind of on the ground for that and got to witness a lot of that happening it's it's a critical part of this book and I and I think Vic's one of her purposes in the story is to give us just another perspective of what's going on amongst the working class yeah I agree Charles so it's we interesting just, seeing yeah yeah let's just get into you want to talk about the little people or yeah let's just get into the little people because that's a fascinating chapter and we've been talking about abercrombie's experimentation and mastery over the point of view before and we've had this similar conversation in the heroes um do you remember the name of the chapter in the heroes casualties casualties thank you So Casualties was a chapter in the Heroes that incorporated a similar, like, POV device (laughs) where you just go from unique POV to unique POV lightning fast. And the Heroes is what it was with soldiers on opposite ends of a battle. Uh, But here, with the little people, it's during a, like, revolt, a working class uprising in a city that's, they've been kind of oppressed with poor workers rights no safety guidelines at all long hours children are working it, deplorable conditions everything's filthy and polluted and and so you're going from person to person both working class that are experiencing this and then like actual factory owners and things like that that are also just as surprised about it and you're getting all their different reactions and it's all coming at you so fast and it's so fascinating to read after reading the heroes to then reading this it's like ah this is what he's been like perfecting this whole time and here we are yet again with this device that's very abercrombian well said charles yeah his use of point of view as always is impeccable and yeah, you get to see during these chapters, it's like, or this chapter, you get to see how this whole revolt, right? It's against it's against people like Savine. It's against people theoretically like uh, Orso mm. and uh, Giselle and Therese. And <laughs> I mean, who are the people that are actually suffering in all of this, it's it, Savine by a stroke of bad luck did end up in the middle of all of it. But it's, I don't know, you think of what happened is like Savine kills someone in the middle of it. She has that moment with that poor girl who lost her father and mm-hmm. uh, just shoves her away. And then we get Gunner Broad out there curb stomping people. And it's like, <laughs> who? It's like the people who are already suffering and the reason for this rebellion are the ones who are then dealing with the consequences of it as well. It's not, I mean, or so we know his side of the story of this, which is he kind of just showed up, got to wear his nice garb and then got to sit in a negotiation, have a plan figured out for him and then everyone got hanged and it was emotionally tumultuous for him. But it's like you get to see through these chapters, the perspectives of just what happens when there's absolute chaos and people revolting theoretically against the crown or whatever, but really against themselves and yeah. the people around them. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's also just, and again, it's the age of madness, right? So it's also a comment yeah. on like how, 
frail society civilization really yeah. is and how much of it is a construct that we just agree to and and there's a quote from this chapter that i think describes kind of the themes of what's going on really well and it's from one of these little people that you know get shuffled through this chapter he had always thought of civilization as a machine cast from this. rigid iron everything riveted in its proper place now he saw it was a fabric gauzy as a bride's veil a tissue everyone agrees to leave in place but one that can be ripped away in an instant and hell lurks just beneath and it's the idea of yeah we all just kind of agree to this <laughs> like to this social construct that is society and it can be taken away very very quickly and it gets messy it gets mad if you will well said charles yeah that's a fantastic quote and one of the ones that i think best exemplifies what this Thank you. uh yeah that uh, trilogy seems but to i see you're holding up a signed and... copy of a little hatred with it <laughs> opened <laughs> uh does that mean you're gonna regale us with another passage Another one, yeah. You picked my favorite. There's, uh, there's <laughs> I have to get another quick. one that I, <laughs> yeah. There's <laughs> another one I really like where uh, it's Mally, another one of the little people in this, and uh, it's uh, someone comes up and yells the great change and grabs her by the arm and almost drags her over, oh, nice and one. then it's like, yeah, it's like what a day eh? and she goes i the great change and says was it change for the better though that was her concern maybe she'd wake tomorrow and the world would suddenly have turned sane and someone would have fixed her broken lock too she had her considerable doubts but what could she do but smile through it and hope for the best at least at that she had plenty of practice and it's like this is <laughs> this is one of the little people here this is uh, and even they're like this is even more chaotic than what we had before that tissue paper has been removed and people are telling themselves a story that this is somehow good but we know how this ends it ends with everyone getting uh, like uh, hanged and it's it's absolutely brutal yeah. That it's like just chaos for chaos's sake. And it's not that the things that are happening to them are okay or should be tolerated, but I don't know. It does feel here like it's not it's not making anything good happen. Yeah, that's well said. And Abercrombie is quick to point out, even while the change is happening, how these funny little quirks and like the absurdity of it all, he never fails to point that out. He, sometimes to a scathing degree and actually the line right before the one you just read where again the guy's yelling the great change the squinty bastard caught Mally by the arm painfully yeah. tight almost dragged her over funny how whenever men talk about freedom they never really meant for the women <laughs> was the, like yeah. the line literally right before that one and it's this idea that's like it's never ending. Like people <laughs> are just going to stomp on other people and you can point out the absurdity in even something like social change and social action. It's like, yeah, but it's really just for you and not for me. Like I'm still getting screwed here. I'm still getting like dragged right. along like unwillingly in all of this. So, yeah, quite literally. <laughs> yeah, quite and literally. Yeah, it's. It's well said, Charles. There's there's a lot of exploration of that in this one, and I think it's no easy answers are provided, at least in a little hatred. And knowing no. Joe Abercrombie, he's not really one to give easy answers. He's he not loves one to provide those, answers, come full right, circle, of gray. any of that. Well, there's some full, well, the first Law Trilogy has some beautiful full circle nature to it i think with i mean even just from the beginning yeah. like the end being the first chapter to the beginning yeah the end, and then but there's it like ends the pike, with like it the glock purposefully to the pike stuff. 
unclimactic, right? Where it's like I Anti-climax. own you and I own everything. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you're not going to have learned your lesson, become a worthy king or anything like that. You're here because I put you here. <laughs> so like that's the same that's the same guy who wrote that that's writing this. So it's hard to tell where this is going. Um I find it very interesting like this idea of again the little people and this rebellion and this idea of society and this age of madness and how society just hangs on a a fabric gauzy as a bride's veil right is the one of the big themes and to choose yeah. a time around like an industrial revolution i think is really on theme because you get a lot into workers rights and things like that where people were mistreated and I like that Abercrombie was willing to progress his world so irreversibly, so far into the future, like that so irreparably like progressed into the industrial age mm. that he's committed to that. And I think it's all for the better. The choosing these choosing these themes about society and and learning more about like what it is to like isn't violence so absurd? Isn't society just as absurd at the same time? And seeing those things hand in hand and people trying to do good, it's like, what does that even mean? <laughs> so right. it, it, it's these explorations that I find to be absolutely fascinating and to, and to grow those themes along with the world at the same time, I, I think is really well done by Abercrombie. It, it's a rare thing in fantasy to see a, a fantasy world progress into an industrial age, yeah. like in front of your eyes from like a medieval swords and sorcery age. And so you're like, wow, this is, um, this is pretty fascinating. I don't know if I've read many stories that do that. Yeah, me neither, Charles. And it has this interesting underlying message to it with some of what we've been talking about before with how, the new generation is learning the same lessons and not taking those lessons from the previous generation at face value, having Mm -hmm. to learn them themselves. And it's, it's almost like a message of society changes, but people don't. (laughs) And it's just new ways to learn these same lessons about violence and oppression and, uh, power and what that does to corrupt people and it's just a a, a spinning uh, gear almost charles like all these gears on the cover of <laughs> a little hatred here it's uh it's tough to see it playing out just with new technology that some of which is making it even easier for people to get killed and hurt and it's uh yeah it's it's interesting to see and i'm very excited for when we get into the stuff that happens later on in this trilogy oh yes we have a lot to say about the trouble with peace yeah a lot to hold it back right now (laughs) holding back but you know we're gonna jump right into it guys wisdom of crowds releases sometime around september 14th or 15th and We are going to be ready, so we're jumping straight into uh, The Trouble with Peace next week, Mm -hmm. get those episodes out, and then, you know, like I kind of flexed on you guys earlier, we have early review copies of Wisdom of Crowd, so we'll be talking about that book shortly after its release, and we have big surprises in store for all you Abercrombie fans at the end of all this. You know, this has been a... Like I have to go back and see, but at least six months, probably more journey that we've been reading through all of these books. And so yeah. we plan on ending it big. And that's all I'm going to say right now. Super excited Great to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Dylan, is there yeah. anything else we need to say about a little hatred before we move on? Nah, I think we covered it, Charles. We did two parts over the course of... <laughs> Probably about two and a half hours on this one. Of course, we can always get in more, but that's mm-hmm. uh, that's what social media is for. Everyone that's can, what social media we'll, is for. We already had some really interesting and, theory discussions and predictions. Yeah. And, you know, some people are like, oh, what if Gunner was a Logan son? And we, we talked about that a little bit. And 
you know, we, we talked about how Calder and Finnery should pursue a relationship. They would probably be a good match if circumstances were a little different. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we talk about it all over on Twitter at the FTF podcast with the number one on the end. So if you want to be part of that discourse, do not hesitate to go over there. But we're going to get into just how you can do that in a moment. Yep. Anything else, Dylan, before we play that sweet, sweet outro music? I think it's time to get that sweet, sweet outro music pumping at this point, Charles. I, yeah, right. I think we've said it all. Let's do it. Here we go. Thank you, everyone, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you like what you heard today, guys, if you want to be part of that first law discourse, we only have two books left. Two books left. Wow. Two books left. So go over to mm. Twitter at the FTF Podcast with a number one on the end and Instagram at the FTF Podcast. And Dylan, if they like what they heard today and they want to support the show further than following us on social media and engaging on our episode discussions, which is our main source of discourse for each book, oh, and they just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do? Toss five stars to our podcast. Just find that Friends Talking Fancy page on the Apple Podcast app. Click the Friends Talking Fancy page. Scroll down past all those episodes until you start seeing stars. Once you're seeing stars, the optimal number of stars to click in order to support the show would be five of them. If you have a little bit of extra time, the Ranger review is extremely helpful for a podcast like ours. But just listening is more than enough. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. We appreciate you. Dylan said it, my sentiments exactly. That's what makes him such a good co-host. And it's true, guys. Just listening is all we could ask for. You guys are the real heroes here. Thank you all so, so much for listening. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends. <laughs> <laughs>